Welcome to Module 5 of ORT5 MES and this is Part 3 which is entitled Scope of Practice. Scope of Practice relates to the skill set of a discipline or profession. So for example if we look at the scope of practice for orthoptists, surgical management of a patient is what we'd consider out of scope for orthoptists as shown there on the left hand side patient having eye surgery but refracting and prescribing glasses on the right hand side is what we classify as in scope. So one type of duty we don't do and the other type of duty we do do and that's in scope. Over time though the scope of practice of professions can actually change um, and in various instances new specialties and new um, disciplines emerge. Orthoptics actually gives us quite a re an excellent example of this type of change and we'll look at that in, in a bit more detail. Here's a bit of a story about orthoptics for you um, in case you're not quite aware of how the profession has evolved. Now the practice of orthoptics actually emerged in the late 19th century and the very very first orthoptist was a lady by the name of Miss Mary Maddox. And she was trained by her ophthalmologist father, Ernest Maddox, and, and you'd be quite familiar with him, I'd imagine. He um, invented the Maddox rod, the Maddox wing, and so on. So that was Mary Maddox's dad, and she was the first orthoptist. He was an ophthalmologist. Now, Mary commenced orthoptic practice in London in the early 1920s. And the first hospital clinic which employed an orthoptist opened at the Royal Westminster Hospital in 1928. Very soon after that in Australia, there was the first hospital clinic employing orthoptists at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. And this was way back in 1931. If you ever visit the Alfred Hospital, you'll actually find a plaque there which commemorates um, the fact that that was the first um, orthoptic uh, clinic in, in Australia there. So if you're at placement at the Alfred, ask where that is and go and have a look at that plaque. So you probably already have a good understanding that the very first orthoptists of Mary Maddox's time and, and after that were trained to specialise in the diagnosis and management of ocular motility and that orthoptics actually means straight eyes. Now with the expansion of our scope of practice and the reassignment of roles that we do, orthoptists today can work in general ophthalmology practices and we can actually offer services beyond ocular motility. And you all know that because you've seen that in, um, out on your clinical placements. In some instances, orthoptists even work only in subspecialty areas. For example, only in laser refractive care or only in cataract care. And again, you've probably come across that in your clinical placement. So task one, read the full scope of practice section in chapter four of Duckett and Wilcox. You'll find that on page 97, 98. And think about these two questions. Why can the advancement of scope of practice or reassignments of roles be challenging? And the second part, list two benefits or advantages to the advancing scope of practice. Another good example of skill escalation can be found in nursing, where more recently the nurse practitioner role has been established in Australia. So this is the focus of task two. I want you to read the Australian Nursing Federation fact sheet, which is called Snapshot of, a nurse, of Nurse Practitioners in Australia, and also the ACNP brochure Transforming Healthcare. And think about these three questions. Firstly, what is the difference between a registered nurse and a nurse practitioner? Two, what is the aim of this role of the nurse practitioner? And three, how do you interpret the term cost-effective care as used in the ACMP brochure? How may the advent of such a role be cost-effective? Task three continues this theme of scope of practice. So you need to read the introduction from the Hoskins paper and answer the following questions. What is the difference between nurse practitioners in Australia 
the United States and Canada as, pe- as compared with the United Kingdom. And given what you've read in Module 4, what may be the issue with the UK model? So Task 4 is a reflective task for you. What I'd like you to do is imagine a remote town where the ophthalmologist only visits three times a year. The local hospital employs a nurse practitioner, but no orthoptist or optometrist is located in the region. Now, this is actually a reality for a lot of places around Australia. How could the advanced skills of the nurse practitioner be potentially utilised in this setting? And secondly, how do you feel about a nurse practitioner doing the work as suggested above in metropolitan Melbourne, where there are numerous orthoptists and optometrists? Are there any issues with this? We'll move straight on to task five now after you've done your reflective task. You need to read the sections titled Interprofessional Working and Role Substitution and Barriers to Interprofessional Working in the discussion of the Hoskins paper. So firstly, how would you define interprofessional learning and interprofessional working? What are the barriers to interprofessional working? And thirdly, reflect on whether you see any blurring of the roles between the three main eye health care professionals, ophthalmology, orthoptics and optometry. For task six, you need to read Skill Escalator in Allied Health paper by Gilmore and answer this question. What factors are suggested that need to be considered when developing advanced practice? I think this is a good one that um, you probably need to discuss in your groups. And as with all of these tasks, it's a good idea to bounce ideas off your group members. So as noted in the paper by Gilmore and others, 2011, it's important to note that policy, policy and legislation can also play a critical role in scope of practice. In the past, orthoptists could not legally prescribe glasses or instill cycloplegics, midriatics or local anaesthetics. So what I need you to do now is reflect on the following. One, given that refraction is an integral part of eye care, how would the restriction of prescribing glasses have affected eye care in specialist clinics where orthoptists are employed? Two, Think about the effect of this restriction if you were an orthoptist with your own practice or if you were involved in an orthoptist-led clinic, for example, where the patient is actually not seen by the ophthalmologist on the same day. What would this mean for the patient? And would this create an additional cost for the patient or government? Why Why would this be the case? And consider that you would have performed the refraction but be unable to prescribe? And three, is this an efficient and cost-effective way to provide services given that orthoptists have the required skill? Task eight is your final task for part three. Firstly, read the section titled Workforce Flexibility in Ducket. Um, This is the Ducket paper interventions to facilitate health workforce restructure not the Ducat textbook, and answer the following question. What does Ducat suggest are further barriers to workforce flexibility? And what types of policy changes does he suggest could assist with improving incentives? After you've done that, read the DOHA brochure, which is called Patients Benefit from Nurse Practitioners Access to Medicare, and reflect on how nurse practitioners' ability to access Medicare item numbers and write prescriptions for the pharmaceutical benefits scheme listed drugs affects clinical practice and patient access to care. We've come to the end of part three of module five. We've looked at healthcare efficiencies and workforce productivity, and we've really delved in depth in terms of scope of practice. The next section, we're going to be looking at service delivery models.